George. Alan Davis speaking. Hello, young man. I've got a job for Deacon. What would that be, ma'am? I want a million dollars in cash moved out of my basement. Well, I think an armored car company would be more appropriate. Uh, but Beacon's men are careful, quick, and kind. And I figured you'd have to be careful with a million bucks, huh? Well, yeah, that's true. But Beacon's has a policy of turning down business we know we can't handle properly. We found that most delays and breakage are caused when a moving company takes on the wrong kind of business, or more business than it can handle. No kidding. At Beacon's, we say we'd rather turn you down than let you down. Oh, wonderful. May I quote you? Sure. <laughs> so, if you're planning to move in the future, please call us first. If we both agree that we can meet your needs, it'll be the best move of your life. Oh, I doubt that, young man. The best move of my life was buying a printing press. Beacons men are careful, quick and kind. Beacons, we'd rather turn you down than let you down. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. Most people look upon their own everyday lives as being routine, without much excitement. But that shouldn't stop anyone from having an active imagination. This is why we make our escape from the humdrum with stories of adventure, mystery, and murder. Another mental activity most people enjoy is fitting together the pieces of a puzzle. The stranger the shapes the more challenging that puzzle becomes. Our present puzzle concerns a young man who is called upon to use all his wits in figuring out the whereabouts of a string of deadly pearls. Now, it's absolutely essential, Keith, that you understand the importance of this assignment. I believe I do, sir. If those pearls aren't recovered, and recovered soon, it's an established fact that someone else will die. I understand. And no matter what happens, no one on that island must have any idea who you really are or what you're doing there. Check. You better be a good actor. I think I can manage that. What do I have to lose? You could lose your life. Our mystery drama, The Deadly Pearls, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Paul Hecht and Kate Reed. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Give your hand to a friend Give your heart to your love But give your coat to contact The sooner the better The common cold is a rotten thing. You miss so much. Sneezing, drips, and congestion can drag you down. Then, ask yourself the contact question. Six or three or one? You'd need six cold tablets, two every four hours, or three ounces of cold's liquid, one every four hours, or just one contact for up to 12 hours continuous relief of those symptoms. That's daytime, then nighttime relief. Both the others have things for aches and fever, and the liquid, something for coughs. Not found in Contact 600 Tiny Time Pills. Give your code to Contact. The sooner the better. Six or three or one. Take Contact. Only as directed. Trembles in the cupboards like money in the bank. When it comes to saving, it's the candles you can bank. That's the truth. One night a week, we have a soup and sandwich supper in our house. The kids love Campbell's chicken noodle soup, so I serve it with their favorite sandwich fixin', salad, and milk. The whole family enjoys it, and it really helps my budget. I keep lots of Campbell's soup in my cupboard. Campbell's in the cupboards, like money in the bank. Saving money's not easy, but I try. One thing that helps is cooking with Campbell's soup. With a can of Campbell's cream of mushroom soup, you can do wonders with ground beef. I found an easy recipe on the label for meatball stroganoff. Mmm, mmm, good. And inexpensive. Stretching out a meal or cooking up the storm. Or teaming up the sandwich with something good and warm. When it comes to saving, it's the Campbell's you can thank. Campbell's in the colors like money in the bank. the 
FBI and the Honolulu police were in on the case, because of certain peculiar circumstances, it was important that the criminal be apprehended by a private investigator. This hazardous assignment went to Keith Spencer, a young man who had proved his physical courage in wartime service. But other qualifications were required for the job, as explained when Keith had his final briefing in San Francisco with the head of the Gordon Investigating Service. Afraid we've given you a rough time these past few days. Oh, I didn't mind, sir. Only I am anxious to get going. Uh, you do type, don't you? Oh, sure. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to prove it, so let's do two things at once. Take over this typewriter, and okay. I'll dictate some paragraphs. Okay, shoot. And uh, I, Keith Spencer, am unmarried... With no living relatives and no dependents. From this day forward and until the completion of this assignment, I have assumed the identity of Robert Keith Ryder. And under no circumstances will I reveal my true identity. Is that all? Yeah. If you'll sign it. Sure. Got a pen? Here. Here. Oh, I suppose you should have signed a statement about your ability to play bridge. What? You did assure us that you play at least an average game of contract. Well, sure, but I didn't realize it was all that important. It could be crucial. Our three suspects are avid bridge players, when they can find a fourth. Okay. Now, before I leave, let's go over the basic facts once more. All right. The missing pearls were cultured. A single strand, about 24 inches long. So they'd hang down about 12 inches if someone was wearing them. They don't sound very spectacular. Yeah, but they are. Jonathan Kohlmeyer, who bought them, was a partner in a watch company which made radium dials. And somehow he managed to have the pearls treated with radium so they would glow in the dark. When he first thought up this scheme, did he have an ulterior motive? Okay. Who knows? It was what happened later that we care about. And you don't think he started out as a murderer? Now, well, that's beside the point. He became one. And when he found out how easy it was, he did it again, three times. Now, clue me in. Who did he bump off first? The first woman he gave the pearls to was said to be very frail. When she died in an accident, Colmeyer was in a state of shock. So no one accused him of complicity in her death. Yeah, but apparently he did retrieve whatever presents he'd given her. Oh, yeah. He was that type. Then he got married. He gave the pearls to his bride, who wore them constantly. She loved that string of pearls. How long did she last? Radium can be a slow death. But it caught up with her after a while, and when she was dying, the doctors suspected radium poisoning. So why didn't they nail her husband right then? It never occurred to anyone to suspect the pearls. How could any smart murderer pull the same stunt again? He fell in love with a young and brainless beauty. Must have really liked her because he didn't give her the pearls for a long time. Not till he retired and they moved to Hawaii. What did she do to deserve such a present? <laughs> Started playing around with another man. Huh. That did it. Kohlmeyer gave her the pearls. She moved out, went off with the pearls and her new boyfriend to a scarcely inhabited island, a small one, well offshore from Oahu. And when she developed an unexplained malady, the boyfriend left her. Big-hearted guy. <laughs> well, after her death, there was an autopsy. And this time, no question. Radium poisoning. Now, why didn't the police move in and confiscate the pearls? There were no pearls to be found. Now, isn't it possible that Kohlmeyer had been there and gotten them? No way. Kohlmeyer committed suicide without returning to the island. Without a confession about what he'd done? Good Lord, no. He was a respected businessman. Now, you think the pearls are still on the island? We're sure of it. But more than that, Keith, we've narrowed down to three people who lived nearest the cottage where the last victim died. So my job, then, is to make friends with these three people and find out quietly which one of them has the deadly pearls. Well, you make it sound too easy. Each of these people is highly eccentric. The few people who come and go from that island are under constant surveillance. <laughs> Including me. Naturally. The pearls were usually kept in a narrow box. It looked like an ordinary jeweler's box, but it was made of lead. Uh, protection against the radium, of course. means it would be heavier than most boxes that size. Well, that makes it seem more elegant. The box is covered with purple velvet and lined with satin. How original. I know. It won't look much different from any jewel box you've ever seen. Mm. 
I can't help thinking how useful a Geiger counter would be. Uh, that's totally out of the question. When you bring a Geiger near a suspected object, it starts ticking. Sure, sure, I know. No gadgets to make life easier. Just your own ingenuity. And it better be damn good. Well, there's not much more I can say, except to wish you luck. I did my homework, and the more I read about those three characters on the island, the more curious I was to meet them. The Honolulu police cleared me, and then I was completely on my own with a photograph of the cottage and a map that showed how to find it. I was given a putt-putt stocked with a supply of canned goods, stowed the typewriter and duffel bag, and at last, I was off. It was a cloudless day, and I found the beaching cove on the island without any trouble. You couldn't see the cottage from the beach, but I knew how to follow directions. Lugging my big canvas bag, I headed up a steep and winding path. And there it was, a neat, modern cottage with an enormous deck from which there must be quite a spectacular view. But I had a spectacular view myself just then, because on that deck was a dazzling blonde. Obviously sunbathing. She sprang to her feet in all her glory, and <laughs> I would have been speechless, except I knew I couldn't be. Who the hell are you? I, oh, uh, this, this is the Colmeyer Cottage, isn't it? What business is that of yours? <laughs> I'm the new tenant. <laughs> this place is not for rent. Uh, no, uh, that's right, not anymore. I've signed the papers. It's mine, uh, for at least a year. Who are you? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. How rude of me not to introduce myself. I'm Robert Keith, the writer in search of a quiet place to hang a typewriter. Oh, I don't believe you. The last thing we need around here is a writer. Lady, I am planning to live here. Not if I can help it. Okay. Uh, I've answered your questions. How about answering one for me? Who are you? None of your business. Since you claim the house is yours, let's see you open the door. That's just what I was about to do. I understand it takes two keys, and here they are, both of them. Where'd you get those keys? <laughs> now, do you believe me? Oh, big deal, you opened the door. And now I know who you are. You're a policeman. They sent you here to spy on us. Well, I'm not going to stand for it. When the supply boat comes around tomorrow, I'll send a message back to my lawyer. No penny anti flunky is going to be spying on me. I assure you, I'm not Don't going to... Don't bother to unpack your things, Robert Keith, because tomorrow... Oh, really, Miss, uh... Mrs. Walsh. Mrs. Barbara Walsh. And you'll find that I have protection against people like you. The gorgeously suntanned Mrs. Walsh slipped her feet into sandals picked up her beach towel from the deck and started along the path which led from the north side of the cottage. You must understand that during our entire conversation, Barbara Walsh was completely in the bath. No bikini. Nothing. Except around her neck and dangling in long loops over her well-formed body. Not pearls, but necklaces made of those decorative native seeds strung together. Ropes and ropes of them. Robert Keith may have thought he was prepared for anything. But this introduction to his new home was an unsettling experience he hadn't counted on. He has now had a most revealing look at one of the three suspects. We'll be there for his encounter with the others when we return shortly with Act Two. Inside you're free Inside you're free after all You hear freedom spirit Like a wild bird's call Inside you're free Inside you're free after all Living free Living free You're on the open road Rolling free and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. mid-sized car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. Nice choice, your Buick. When a skin injury makes your child cry out in pain, or a 
Remember, there's one hope. Cancel to the multi-purpose family medication that instantly stops the pain of minor cuts, scrapes, burns, even cold sores and fever blisters. Campofenique gently penetrates skin injuries to kill germs, protect against infection, helps nature heal skin injuries. Campofenique, the penetrating first aid medication, stops pain instantly. Campofenique. Campbell's in the cupboards like money in the bank. When it comes to saving, it's the Campbell's you can't thank. You bet. Campbell's soup's a good, inexpensive way to help fill up the kids. They love to sit down to steaming bowls of Campbell's chicken with rice soup at lunchtime. Mm-mm, good. These days, I want lots of Campbell's soup in my cupboard. When it comes to saving, it's the Campbell's you can thank. Campbell's in the cupboards like money in the bank. Robert Keith found the cottage very much to his liking. He had expected something rather dark and sinister. But one wall of the living room had a big picture window. And in the bedroom, there was a slanting skylight directly over the bed. It was certainly no place to hide. And Keith realized that whatever he did could be watched at close range, if anyone cared about what he was doing. He spent the first evening getting settled... And after a late supper of canned goods, he turned in for the night. At about three o'clock in the morning, he was sleeping soundly when... Uh, what the devil? Uh, hey, hey, who's out there? Well, bless my soul. Hey, would you mind pointing that gun in another direction? Not until I find out what you're up to. Look, I, I was sound asleep. I, I, I'm i living here. No one lives in this house. Put up your hands. Now put down your gun, would you, sir? Sir, I'm a man of honor. Colonel George Manson's the name. Army retired. And no one sets foot on this island without reporting to me. Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know that, Colonel. And uh, If you'll come in, I'll, I'll show you my credentials. What the hell's that? Is, is there someone else out there? No, no. Wait a minute, I'll check you out later. Right now, I recommend you go back to bed. There's a wild boar under the deck, and I aim to get him. When the sun came up, it was another cloudless day. And after breakfast, I decided to pay a visit. <laughs> Not eager to encounter either the gun-happy colonel or the wild-eyed lady with no clothes, it seemed wise to seek a formal introduction to the third island resident. The path to her property was overgrown with luxuriant shrubbery, but it opened up into an area dotted with palm trees surrounding a small stone house. Squatting in the midst of a flower bed was a gnome of a woman wearing one of those loose garments the Hawaiians call moo-moos. I wondered when you were coming. You, uh, you were expecting me? Of course. You're the writer who's moved into the death cottage. Uh, moved into the what? Well, surely the rental agent told you that the three former tenants died there. I think you're just trying to frighten me, but I don't scare easily. You're very sure of yourself, aren't you, Mr. Keith? Well, you know my name. Well, since we're going to be neighbors, perhaps you'll tell me... I'm Nora Babcock. And if you'll help me up, we'll go to my porch where the coffee's perking. I assisted Miss Babcock to her feet. The aging body was stooped and slow-moving, and her hands were badly crippled, yet... She used them capably to pour the coffee when we were seated at a wicker table on her porch. Oh, yes, Mr. Keith. I've lived on this island for a long time. That house was just a shack when the poor man, a writer like yourself, was stabbed to death in a ghastly pool of blood. The cottage was rebuilt before an unfortunate woman was strangled there. And then it was fixed up with all that glass to let the sun in. But nothing could save the last dear lady who simply wasted away. Well... Here's hoping I'll have better luck. That depends. When were you born, Mr. Keith? You mean what year? No, 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 no. The date. The day. The hour. Oh, um, I, I was born in August. Uh, 14th of August. Oh. You sound disappointed. You certainly don't look like Leo. The lion. And I would have thought that a writer... Ah, oh, but no matter. There may be other factors. You belong to the northern sign of the Zodiac. The middle point of the magnet of the fire triplicity. <laughs> Is that a fact? Oh, you'd better not laugh at me, Mr. Keith. 
I'll tell you right now that you and I are destined to be enemies. You belong with Sagittarius, Libra, or Aries. Ah, come on, Miss Babcock. I'm really not so bad. Now, tell me about your sign. I'm Gemini. The positive people of the air triplicity. You mean, you mean air and fire don't mix? Dangerously, Mr. Keith. Very dangerously. Your sign is governed by the sun, and your gems are carnelian and sardonyx. Well, I wouldn't know a sardonyx if I stumbled over one. My governing planet is mercury. Emeralds, moonstones... And pearls are my sign. And I have a very special affinity for pearls. Mrs. Walsh had obviously passed along word of my arrival, which was why the colonel had come trying to flush me out, and the reason Miss Babcock knew my name and occupation. So, that afternoon, I became a spy, hidden in the underbrush with binoculars trained on the three of them walking along the beach. I was darn sure they were planning some strategy to get me evicted. Then, Colonel Madison left the two ladies and headed up the trail toward my house. I went quickly to the typewriter and pretended to be busily at work. Well, now, Mr. Keith, I hope I'm not disturbing you. Beautiful day, isn't it? Yes, uh, that it is. How are you, Colonel? Oh, couldn't be better. Say, uh, I'm sorry about last night. Wouldn't want you to think we're not hospitable around here. Do you mind if I sit down? No, please, please do. I was beginning to feel like an outcast. <laughs> I gather you've met the ladies. Yes, they didn't exactly give me a warm welcome. Uh, oh, pay no attention. Batty old Babcock won't be a problem. She's usually off in outer space, you know, talking to the stars. I gather she's hipped on astrology. Oh, mad as a hatter. Even though she does play a good game of bridge. <laughs> Uh, you say you're also acquainted with uh, Barbara Walsh? If you mean, have I had a good look at her, you're darn right. Uh, <laughs> stunning, isn't she? <laughs> you said it. Well, now, tell me, Colonel, what's a woman like that doing all by herself way out here? <laughs> but if this were a British colony, I'd say she's a remittance woman. She's being paid to stay away? Yeah, being paid very well. The big man in her life is a, well, a, a mafia type. They nabbed him. My guess is the family's afraid she'll talk unless she's kept well out of the way until he's released from jail. What's he in for? No oh, drug traffic, I think. I don't know. Dealing in stolen goods. Uh, let's, let's talk about you, Mr. Keith. You writer fellows interest me. What's your special subject? I'm a novelist. Uh, science fiction sometimes, but mostly light stuff. Hmm. Know anything about pearls? <coughs> uh, no, not much. Uh. How would you like to come over to the other side of the island and watch the pearl divers? Pearl divers? Uh, here? Oh, well, it's, it's not like Ceylon or the Sulu Sea. But they go through the motions here twice a week during the season. Occasionally they come up with a creditable pearl. Come along if you want to. Well, I'd like that very much. Fine. Oh, wear some stout walking shoes and I'll pick you up in about, about an hour. Colonel arrived in his old army uniform carrying a sturdy walking stick. We started off on a barely marked trail, and I marveled at the beauty of the place with its lush flowers and brightly colored birds. And not that way, Mr. Keith. We take a sharp turn over here. Go up the hill. Well, well, just a minute. Th this island must be more populated than I thought. I, I hear music. Oh, it's just Barbara Walsh with her radio going. She has it on all day long. That or a stereo. Come along. Get ready for a steep climb. The path went straight up, and I had to scramble to keep the colonel from getting too far ahead. But quite suddenly, all the lush greenery ended, and we came out on a rocky promontory overlooking the sea. Uh, uh, we made it. <laughs> That's quite a view. Hey. Uh, now, you see those small boats way out there? Yeah. Those are the oyster fishermen. The, the flat-bottomed boats are dragging nets. Uh-huh. And from those kayak-looking things, you may be able to see the young men diving. Won't they come closer to shore? No, not, not much closer. It's too treacherous when the tides are running as high as they are today. Go on. Out on that big rock so you can get a better look. Is it steady? Oh, 
like Gibraltar. Go on, Mr. Keith, out further. Don't be afraid. Watch your step, Mr. Keith. Oh, merciful uh, heaven! Colonel, help me, Colonel! Help! Help me! Hang on, Keith, hang on! I'm trying to get a foothold! Here, here! Grab my walking stick! I grabbed the stick because I had to, even though I knew it was the same stick that had been pushed into the middle of my back just a moment before. Well, I'll say you're a brave man, Keith. I like the way you handled yourself back there on the rocks. I wouldn't say I had much alternative. Uh, it was all the fault of your shoes, Mr. Keith. That's what it was. I warned you to wear walking shoes. Uh, I say, Mr. Keith, why don't we stop by to see Barbara? Right now? Why not? We need a drink. <laughs> and she has a good liquor supply. No, I think I'd better get back and tend to these scratches. <laughs> Take a look at my clothes. I'm in no condition to go visiting. Well, as you wish. I'll leave you then at the foot of this hill. And, um, oh, yes, yes, I, I've been meaning to ask you, Keith. Do you play bridge? Well, I'm not the world's best, but yes, I play. Oh, splendid. I'm rather out of practice. Well, heavens knows, so are we. Well, let's say my house, Friday evening. Come for supper, round seven. Well, thank you. Tell me, Mr. Keith, you did get scratched up. Your hands are still bleeding. Uh, perhaps I should go with you. I'll be all right. Uh, yes. Well, I, I'm off then uh, to tell the ladies the good news. Good news? Why, yes, yes. The good news that we found a new bridge partner. Uh, and I might as well warn you to bring our fat wallet. Our stakes are high. After a shower and some soothing applications of witch hazel and ointments, I rested on the big bed under the skylight. The front door was wide open for the benefit of a magnificent sea breeze. But suddenly I was on the alert. Someone, someone was on the steps leading to the deck. Then there were slow, heavy footfalls and the tap of a cane. Mr. Keith? Mr. Keith? Are you all right? Oh, why, hello, Miss Babcock. Yes, uh, come in. Oh, I heard you'd had an accident and I thought you might not be able to fix your own supper. So I've brought you some nice oyster stew. Oh, well, that's very thoughtful of you. There. It's one of my specialties. Just warm it up. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sit down. Uh, won't you share the stew with me? No, no, no. no. I, I've had my, my dinner. Uh, let me see your injury. Are there nothing but scratches? I was lucky. Oh, I could be serious. And you are not lucky, Mr. Keith. I looked at the stars last night. And the heavens do not bode well for anyone born under the sign of Leo. But you see me alive and well. I could have crashed all the way down those rocks and into the sea. Look out for more danger ahead. That was simply the first warning. Miss Babcock knew what she was talking about. And it had nothing to do with the stars. I heated the oyster stew and it was delicious. In fact, the best I've ever tasted. But about an hour later... I began to feel drained of all energy. I thought it was just a reaction from a rather strenuous day and decided the best thing to do was go to bed and sleep it off. It was a tremendous effort to get undressed, but I managed to drag myself, partially clothed, onto the big bed. In a prone position, I, I felt as though I were being suffocated and panic was setting in. I'd been poisoned. And no one was going to save my life this time unless I did it for myself. Literally, I crawled into the bathroom for the well-stocked medicine kit. Yes, I was prepared with antidotes for poison, but time was too short to figure out which one would be appropriate. By now, my hands and feet were growing numb, and breathing was getting more and more difficult. I mixed up a heavy pink liquid in a, in a glass of water... And just before blacking out, I was very, very sick. When I came to, I was lying on the bathroom floor, weak, but grateful to find I was still alive. Very slowly, I got to my feet and staggered toward the bedroom, hoping at last to sleep off the effects of whatever had been in that poisonous stew. 
but my whole body sagged and I knew I'd never make the bed, so I eased myself down on a narrow couch in the living room and fell instantly into a heavy slumber. Once again, it it must have been about three o'clock in the morning when there was a sound which would have awakened the dead. The skylight in the bedroom, back flat against the wall, I waited for minutes that seemed like an eternity. No movement. Absolute silence. So I crept into the next room, armed with a flashlight, and cupping the beam, examined the bed. It was a mass of shattered glass. In the darkness once more, I moved stealthily to the front door, opened it without a sound, and stared into total blackness. Slowly, I raised the flashlight and then snapped it on full beam, pointing straight down the path. Facing directly toward me stood the statuesque Mrs. Barbara Walsh, fully clothed in the long, dark kimono. And over her breasts hung a necklace of gems which burst into life like Fourth of July sparklers. I must warn you not to jump to conclusions. If you imagine that Mrs. Walsh was wearing the stolen pearls, think again. Diamonds are the jewels that glitter when exposed to light. A pearl is sometimes a gem of great value, but it is not a precious stone. And one can scarcely say that pearls sparkle, while radium... Remember the dial on your watch or bedside clock? Radium glows in the dark. We'll be back shortly with Act Three. Never heard of beer on the rocks? No? Swell. The people who brew Budweiser never have thought ice in your beer was such a cool idea anyway. If you only knew how ice cuts down the head and waters the taste. Oh, chilling thought. A downright tragedy with Budweiser especially. Budweiser is the king of beers. The only beer in America that's beechwood aged, naturally carbonated. Which means Bud brews its own bubbles, tiny ones, over a dense lattice of beechwood strips. The beer ages the best way, the right way, naturally. But add an ice cube and bloop, there goes all that extra effort. So if you forget to cool enough, bud, skip the cubes and put your Budweiser on ice for a while, on the coldest shelf in your refrigerator. Even if the weight does frost you a little, it'll be worth it. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. Who knows how to help you solve your shopping problems? Your Meta Business Bureau. I'm going to rent this apartment, but now the landlord wants a deposit equal to two months' rent to cover damage. I wonder if there's anything I should do to protect myself. There certainly is, Lou. Who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau. Deposits are usual, but before you move into that apartment, go through it thoroughly and list any and all damage. Prepare this list in duplicate and have your landlord sign both copies. And before you sign that lease, Find out what sort of repairs you will be responsible for and which are to be paid for by the landlord. Then when you move, this list helps you to solve the mystery of who's to pay for what, right? Right. for Robert Keith, the next two nights and three days were totally uneventful. He dozed in the sun, occasionally pecked at the typewriter, and did a great deal of thinking. Keith looked forward eagerly to the evening of bridge, and as he approached the colonel's house for the first time, he found a charming, sprawling building with a table set out of doors on what the Hawaiians call a lanai. He was glad he had purchased a colorful sports shirt in Honolulu, although it paled beside the one Colonel Madison was wearing over his white slacks. 
Even Miss Babcock looked festive in her flowered moo. Hi. Ah, welcome, my boy, welcome. You're looking much better, Mr. Keith. They're quite recovered, thank you. Now, this island air will cure anything. Anything but my arthritis. Where's Barbara? Oh, always late. I suspect she's getting herself decked out. <laughs> Ready for the kill. Oh. You express things so aptly, Colonel. <laughs> if it's like old times, Barbara will come prepared for murder at the bridge table. Oh, I'm speaking... Oh, hello, oh, everybody. Oh, oh, Barbara. Well, you've outdone yourself. Hey, dazzling. Simply dazzling. Oh, Colonel. And, uh, Nora, dear. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> I believe you've met Mr. Keith. My lawyer has verified that he exists. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Mr. Keith, you may have the right to live on this island, but that doesn't mean that I have to love my neighbor. Oh, no, 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 Barbara. However, since we have so little opportunity for social occasions, I propose we declare an armed truce. But I'm not at war with you, Mrs. Walsh. Speak for yourself. Peace for the evening. Dinner began with oysters on the half shell. Six enormous oysters for each of us. And I shall be interested in your opinion of these, Keith. Delivered by my favorite fisherman, fresh from the beds this morning. Colonel, look. My horoscope said this would be a lucky day. Well, bless my soul. No, there has nothing in me. I found one, too. But I suspect you, Colonel. Come on, confess. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I confess. (laughs) Party favors. There's a pearl in every oyster shell. Oh, you rogue. I must say this is rather a good one. Nice Oh, I love them. Every one, they feel so good. I thought the surprise was just for the ladies, but I see you've included me. Very pretty, Colonel. Well, let that be the beginning of your collection. Uh, I hope you won't mind if some of them are already pierced. You mean a pearl like this one has been removed from a string? Yes, that's right. Part of my hobby. I seldom find a string that meets my standards for matching, so I, I rematch them and mix them. Oh, but come, let's finish our dinner so we can get on to the battle. Afraid I'll have to pass. Uh, I say three no trumps. Uh, well, four hearts. Five no trumps. Barbara, do you have a ring on every finger? Uh, only on eight. Oh, I wish I could wear them. With my poor crippled hand. Oh, shut up, Nora. You're just trying to distract me. I have a contract to make. It was a cutthroat game, no question about it. Only, strangely, we were quite evenly matched. We played three rubbers, so I had my chance with each one as a partner. By this time, we were on a first-name basis. Well, that's it. And as usual, top honors go to the ladies. In points, let's see. Barbara's first, then Nora, followed by Bob. (laughs) And uh, as is proper for a gracious host, I'm last. Uh, It'll take a minute to figure out who owes what here. I think the prize should go to Robert and me for that last small slam. (laughs) I wouldn't have dreamed that Leo and Gemini could work so well together. Uh, Tell me, Mr... I mean, Robert. Never Bob. Isn't there some way you could find out the owl of your birth? What rubbish. Well, if it would please you, Miss Nora, I suppose I could write and ask my mother. Well, you do that. It's very important. Oh, Nora. Uh, speaking of my mother, you've all given me a very good idea. But I'd like to send her a present. A present for your mother? <laughs> You'll think I'm sentimental, but many years ago, my dad gave her a string of pearls as an anniversary present, and well, they were her greatest treasure. Dad's been dead a long time now, and she was heartbroken when the pearls were stolen from her New York apartment. Oh, well, well, say no more. I'll fix you up. How much do you want to pay? Oh, now, just a minute, Colonel. I'm afraid you deal in merchandise that's too rich for my blood. I'm, I'm talking about a simple string of cultured pearls. A couple of hundred dollars? <laughs> now you're on the right track. Ridiculous. Yeah. Excuse me, everybody, but I'm very tired. Time to go home. Oh, I'll be happy to escort the ladies. Don't bother with me. Perhaps you're not aware that I spend most of every night wandering around the island alone. Oh, go with them, Barbara. Well, you'll have to help me with the dishes. Oh, that does it. Walking with Nora Babcock was a tortuous business, and I had a feeling she was in pain every step of the way. And we lost sight of Barbara, although she had an unsettling trick of appearing on the path, sometimes in front of us, sometimes behind. And when we reached the door of Nora's house, 
She's out there somewhere. And I don't want her to hear. If you'll come to my house tomorrow afternoon, I'd like to talk to you about those pearls for your mother. Fine. At what time? Around two o'clock. Okay, be seeing you. Good night. And now you may have the pleasure of seeing me home. Oh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a pleasure uh, and a surprise. You want to know what I have against you, don't you? I am curious. Well, come to my house for a nightcap and I'll tell you. What do you think of my pad? Exotic luxury. Mm, you writers have a way with words. But you don't fit the pattern. And what pattern is that? Novelist, I despise. Oh, come on. We're no different from anyone else. My husband was a woman hater who wrote about women and knew nothing about them. Oh, that man crucified me in his books. Well, I know, you're different. I could tell from the way you talked about your mother. <laughs> uh, come over here. Sit on the couch. Hmm. That's better. Hold my hand. You know... You know, it's been frightfully dull around here. Pretty hands. But uh, don't your fingers get tired under all those rocks? Take the rings off. It'll make you feel any more comfortable. Uh, let's see. Rubies. Diamonds. Sapphires. Suppose you'd never stoop to wearing something as simple as a pearl. On the contrary. My most prized possession, I own a string of priceless pearls. Over there in that velvet box. May I see them? I don't put them on display for just anybody. Um, <laughs> you're a good boy. I'll show them to you. Here, let me freshen your drink. You have some fascinating things in this room. That uh, Buddha, for instance. It's carved from jade. And, uh, ah, are these the pearls? Put down that box. Oh, you said you'd show them to me. But it's locked and I, uh, I have to get the key. Oh, yes, Bob. I said I'd show you the pearls. If you're a good boy. And I will. Tomorrow morning. After you spend the night. <laughs> I was having breakfast next morning in the sunshine on my deck. Uh, yes, I was alone. I had not spent the night with Barbara Walsh. In my line of work, it has to be business before pleasure. <laughs> there was no need to accept a bribe. You see, when I picked up that purple velvet jewel box, it was light as a feather. But, as I was saying, while eating breakfast... Hey, good morning. You're a late riser. Yeah, I went to a big party last night, Colonel. Go on, have a cup of coffee. I brought you something. Uh, don't pay any attention to the looks of the box. The velvet's worn. <laughs> it's been around for a while. It's what's inside that counts. I'd be glad to sell you the pearls. Oh. Open the box. Oh, they're beautiful. Well, these are not the ones we were talking about last night. I mean, this is a double strand... <laughs> Obviously far more expensive. I know, I know. They can be sold for several thousand dollars someday. But my price to you still stands. Oh, no, 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 Colonel. I, I just can't accept it. My good man, I'm offering you the kind of bargain that comes once in a lifetime. But it'll never do for my mother. Don't you have something else? Yes, of course I do. I thought I owed you a favor. Oh, you owe me nothing. Now, please, Colonel, if you'll let me go to your house, but. Perhaps you could show me another string that would be... I, 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 I'll show you nothing right now. Good morning, sir. The colonel stopped off, and I knew I would have to change my approach if I wanted to look at his collection. And I'd think about that later, because my next appointment was with Nora Babcock. Come in, Robert. Didn't we have a good time last night? You can be my bridge partner anytime. That's very sweet. Um, I, I meant to ask you... How did you like my oyster stew? Well, the taste was superb, but... Uh, uh, didn't it help you to go to sleep? <clears throat> Look, I'll level with you, Miss B. You put something in that stew, didn't you? Oh, I, uh, the usual dash of chili sauce and, and, and plenty of rich cream. No, no, no. I mean, 
I mean something, something bad. Oh. I don't understand. That stew made me deathly ill. Why, I, I wanted you to sleep well after your accident, so I did put in a drop or two of my sedative. The kind that helps me. Uh, from one of those bottles. Uh, perhaps it shouldn't have been combined with the seafood. Yeah, perhaps. I thought you were trying to poison me. How could you have such thoughts about a poor old lady? I take them all back. Mm -hmm. When is your mother's birthday? Oh, it's in June. Like yours. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. My pearls were a present. And nothing would please me more than giving them to a Gemini. Oh, that's, that's very generous of you, but oh, I... Please, I just... get the pearls for me, Robert. On that cabinet over there. Okay. You, you'll find the box is rather heavy. You say these pearls were given to you? Yes. Yes. By the dear lady who lived in your cottage. I took care of her, poor thing. And before she died, she gave me her dearest treasure. Open the box and tell me what you think. I think they're perfect. Oh, you don't know the best part. These pearls have a magical quality. Just wait until you see what happens to them at night. Hmm. Pick them up, examine them. Yeah. I like the way they look against the satin. Oh, how I love them. Nora, just when do you wear these pearls? Oh, they're not for wearing. At least not for me. I like to fondle them. Before my hands got so... so bad, I used them the way the Greeks do. You, you know, worry beads. <laughs> I've often taken them to bed with me. Nora, these hands of yours... Oh, it's, it's not my hands. You see how hard it is for me to get around. Yes, I, I know. Uh, have you been to a doctor? No use. I have my medicines. Though they don't do much good. I know a fine doctor in Honolulu. I, I think he can help you. Will you let me take you to him? Oh, I couldn't let you do that, Robert. Look in the stars. How many times have I told you? I've been warned never to trust a Leo. Look, Nora... For reasons I won't trouble you with, and that, of course, I wouldn't want the colonel or Barbara to know, I'm not the person I pretended to be. Would it make any difference to you if I told you I was actually born on January the 2nd? Why, all the difference in the world I should have known. We were destined to be friends from the very beginning, Mr. Keith. Yes. Uh, just Keith. That's my real first name. I'll go with you wherever you want me to go. Case closed. Miss Babcock's destiny was not written in the stars, even though she went to her grave believing it was. The deadly pearls were taken out of circulation, and Nora Babcock was given the best of care in a hospital where they did what they could to ease the pain during the short time she had left to live. It was thought best not to shatter her dream, so she never knew that Keith Spencer was an orphan or that her treasured pearls had been anything but a comfort. I'll be back shortly. Young I may be, but still I'm a man. Just turned 18 and I'll do what I can to find me a place where I can be. the new Navy. You'll get your chance at success, learn an exciting job, and see the world. Call toll-free 800-841-8000. That's 800-841-8000. Or see your Navy recruiter. Be someone special in a new Navy. I know where I'm going from here. Spencer found a good deal more on that island than the missing pearls. He stepped into the lives of three people whose philosophies did not agree with his, yet with each, 
he had at least one point of mutual understanding. Our mystery was solved with the apprehension of a victim rather than a culprit. Our cast included Kate Reed, Paul Hecht, Grace Matthews, and Kurt Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'll tell you why I called you, Sam. Your favorite parolee, Steve Janos, was just in. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what a big football fan you are. Me, it's the Polish. What's on my mind? I don't know. The Cleveland police just sent me down a picture of that wife of his. And... Huh? Oh, no, no. she's not marked up in what I'm looking at. Sensational looking doll. Too good to just pass up. What I want to know is, how are you coming on that trace you've had out on her? Yeah. Well, the moment anything turns up, you get on the pipe. Even tonight, I'll be here late. I wouldn't want to know that your boy and this girl were in the same town. That could be begging for trouble. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... is when people find out if they're out of shape. Combine cool weather with outdoor exercise and you get aches and pains. Hi, Frank Lieber here with relief from True Value Hardware Stores, a northern electric heating pad. It's the bargain of the month, a $5.95 value for just $2.99. Just plug it in, then put it wherever you hurt. On the aching back that you got from working outdoors when it was a lot colder than you thought, on the sore legs you got from hiking through the woods without warm enough clothing you'll find out that True Value Hardware Store's Bargain of the Month is a timely one. The Northern Heating Pad soothes aching muscles and helps tense muscles relax. It has three heat settings and a nightlight on the control switch. On the inside, there's a pad that surrounds the heating element. It's waterproof. On the outside, there's a removable, washable flannel cover. This Northern Electric Heating Pad...